so I have a whole bunch more questions, but I'm sure you do too. So I want to go out uh, to the audience uh, first here, and then I'll pick some online. Uh, my two requests are that you identify yourself and your organization uh, uh, and uh, make a brief comment or question. Uh, and uh, I'll take uh, two or three to begin with. Uh, ask you guys, if you don't mind, to keep sure. track of one or two of them. Uh, and then we'll come back to you and then go back to the audience. Um, so uh, uh, first we have a uh, woman in the back here. If you stand up, it just might be easier. Yeah, sorry, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Great, thanks, Theo. <laughs> and uh, uh, the gentleman next to her, uh, just sorry to keep the mic in the same place. <laughs> Thank you. And what was your name, sir? Uh, Roger. Thank you. Uh, and and just the, this gentleman in the blue, a few rows up here. Minister, my, I'm Saif Ahmed. I represent an organization called Penny Appeal. We are based in the uh, United Kingdom, and we have also an offices in Sydney, Ponspol. Um, Minister, I was impressed with your presentation. I was just wondering whether you could shed some light with regard to the 25,000 odd Syrian refugees that you are going to uh, bring into Australia in terms of integration, integrating them into the Australian labor market. Uh, if you uh, can shed some lights on that. Thank you. Okay, three great questions. I, I hope you had a chance right, to, okay. to write them down. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I think there, a lot of them are directed at you, but we'll let you, uh, uh, we'll let you come in as well, Albert, if you have something to add. Um, can I, uh, just on the question of soft power, um, I talked broadly, obviously, about Australia's engagement in the Pacific. One of the most important things that we do is our uh, defence uh, program in the Pacific. Australia has provided patrol boats uh, for uh, Pacific Island countries, and we are in the process now uh, of rolling out new patrol boats to countries. Now, patrol boats have been very, very important, not just uh, predominantly for surveillance, uh, and the new patrol boats that are going to be rolled out not only have a greater capacity, but with them come as part of that program uh, additional surveillance, air surveillance, because of course, as I mentioned, one of the um, security issues that we have in the Pacific and, uh, is unregulated, uh, unreported and illegal fishing. Fishing is vitally important for our Pacific Island countries and so therefore the protection of fish stocks is vitally important and our Pacific Island uh, program um, really does help. Um, at the last Pacific Island Forum uh, meeting in Samoa we talked about greater integration uh, of um, bodies within the Pacific to have greater coordination. Of course, one of those is the Fisheries Agency, and Albert might have a bit more to say on that. When we talk about uh, security um, in the Pacific today, we are talking about, um, as I mentioned, the fishing issue. We're talking about drug trafficking. We're talking about transnational crime, cyber, a whole range of different things. So as part of that um, 
uh, development, diplomacy and defence, uh, yes, uh, that is certainly something that we do uh, very much. Our step-up engagement in the Pacific is very much uh, focused on a whole range of things which, of course, uh, do revolve uh, around uh, those issues. Um, one of the other things that we will see uh, is as a consequence of the regional assistance mission to the Solomon Islands, um, the Pacific Island Forum itself is of the view that Pacific Island countries should come together uh, in a broader regional security pact, uh, which we are in the process now under the auspices of the Pacific Island Forum uh, now working through and hopefully will be, uh, we're in the process now of working through the, the nuts and bolts of that. But that's the day-to-day -day security which covers a whole range of, of these different things. We will also, uh, as part of that uh, rollout in Australia, uh, Pacific Security uh, College. Again, capacity building, uh, focusing on those points. So to your question, yes, um, is the simple answer, um, and it's a multi-dimensional, multi-layered uh, engagement where those three things uh, work very, very closely together. Um, to your point, I think it was Roger in relation uh, uh, to MICA, um, the uh, Australian government uh, will not commit to, if I can put it this way, a prescriptive time-bound um, A target, um, certainly until uh, our um, economy is back on a sustainable footing. Um, but can I say that um, uh, last year our uh, aid uh, was increased to $3.9 billion, which was an increase of 2.2%. Uh, and uh, at last year's budget, um, we indicated that uh, it would be $4 billion uh, and $4 billion. So it would be at $4 billion for two years. Can I just, though, say to you uh, from my car, uh, also, one of the things that I think is really important when we are talking about partnerships in the Pacific, uh, the religious, um, uh, the institutions. Religion is a very important focus in the Pacific. And I have to say that uh, I would really like to see a greater cooperation by the churches uh, in the Pacific, uh, particularly given issues such as domestic violence, um, the very, very high levels of domestic violence in the Pacific in particular. And I think the churches have a far greater role to play. So if I can publicly say to you, uh, I would really like to see greater responsibility and greater involvement by MICA uh, on this particular issue, because I think you have a far greater role to play. I mean, my bias Bible doesn't, I don't read in my Bible um, that uh, a man should be able um, to um, be violent towards his wife, but I really do think that there should be a greater focus by the churches, particularly in the Pacific, to assist and help deal with this insidious issue, particularly in countries where you have such a high level of religious adherence, but also high levels of domestic violence. Um, on the third point in relation to the integration of the Syrians, uh, Australia um, has um, our uh, uh, humanitarian uh, um, uh, program has now risen to 18,750 uh, per annum. The 12,000 in intake of the Syrian refugees was uh, an additional amount. I can say that all the all the um, uh, refugees under that humanitarian, under that special intake are now in Australia and we hope that they are um, uh, coming uh, in and, uh, and settling quite well. We've certainly, um, over the forward estimates, if I can put it that way, over the forward estimates, the four years, the cost um, of that intake was $840 million. So as you can appreciate, uh, that was a large commitment by Australia in relation to a humanitarian. Australia is uh, one of the highest takers of humanitarian uh, refugees under, our, under the UNHCR program. We have been consistently a country of migrants. Indeed, since World War II, Australia has welcomed 7.5 million uh, mi uh, migrants to Australia, including um, 850 or so thousand under our humanitarian program. So we have a very strong record of migration. We have a strong record of a well-integrated 
multicultural society. Uh, we are one of the most multicultural yet socially cohesive nations on earth. And I think that um, um, I myself am a product of that. Um, my parents came out to Australia in the 1950s. So um, today uh, about 50% of Australians were either born overseas or have at least one parent born overseas. So uh, we truly have been, we're very proud of our very strong multicultural but very successfully multicultural country in the world. I think that ad addresses all yeah. three. Yeah, Albert, I don't know if there's anything you want to follow up on. I'm, I'm curious, you know, the, the, the UK having reached 0.7 commitment um, is both very proud of that, but is also uh, used it as uh, an idea that they're reaching it would encourage others to do so as well. Is there a dynamic within the Commonwealth uh, on this issue? Um, is there a, a Commonwealth commitment uh, from OECD countries to reach 0.7, or is that not something that's discussed? Discuss in my part of the organisation, that's for sure. But just to comment on uh, the specific patrol boat uh, project in the Pacific, that is one successful uh, project that Australia has provided to the Pacific member states, given the wide span of uh, maritime zones in the, in, the, in the region. This particular project is of tremendous uh, benefit to the island countries, and that, that of course, uh, has been done very closely in close collaborations with New Zealand and France. In, uh, in terms of uh, maritime surveillance with the support of the Forum Fisheries Agency in uh, Solomon Islands. Uh, we actually have a, a, a question coming in online. It very much relates to the last comment you made from uh, Claudia Santos, who's a PhD candidate in climate change at the University of Lisbon. Uh, thank you for watching, Claudia. Um, she asks, what is Australia's vision on environmental migration from the Pacific Islands, particularly vulnerable to sea level rise? Is Australia working towards opportunities to address this issue? Well, um, one of the things that is part of our step up engagement um, has been labour mobility. I mean, we think that um, um, in our region, this has been very, very valuable. Um, um, last year, um, Australia remit all the remittances from Australia uh, to the Pacific were about 2.5 billion dollars. Um, so uh, Australia uh, fo has focused on a number of programs where we have a seasonal worker program, which recently the World Bank um, did a, uh, a report on it and found it to be a very very successful uh, program. And so therefore we have. Um, that's basically, though, in the horticultural, agricultural area. As part of our step up, we are now expanding uh, our labour mobility to um, uh, areas such as health, aged care, uh, tourism and accommodation. Um, visas will be for up to three years to build capacity, and that capacity with the objective then of people who do come to Australia for up to three years to work uh, under this labour mobility can then utilise that capacity um, in, their, in their own countries. So um, for, for us, labour and labour mobility and the importance of that um, really um, has not only helped, but we believe that that will um, help uh, in, the, uh, in the future. Um, can I just start on the issue of um, the environment? Uh, Australia has um, committed, uh, we are very engaged with our uh, countries uh, in the Pacific. Uh, we have uh, assisted countries, particularly in terms of maritime boundaries. We have assisted our, our neighbours in relation to oceans and oceans management. Uh, we do a lot of work in the coastal management space, uh, particularly in terms of coastal and sustainable coastal fisheries uh, management. Um, so we have assisted in a whole range of things. Um, so at this point in time, um, I know that there are some issues <laughs> in relation to usage of the term refugees, particularly in terms of environment. But we are conscious of uh, the implications of sea level rises, um, and uh, Australia is working with countries. Uh, we know that this is an issue that has been raised uh, in international fora. Um, the Prime Minister of Tuvalu indeed raised it in a forum where I was chairing at the UN Oceans Conference. So we are conscious of um, the potential for um, um, maritime boundaries to be uh, affected as a consequence of sea level rises, and we know that this is an issue that is being raised. From Australia's perspective, we are lending support and assistance 
two different countries in terms of maritime boundary issues. And again, this is an issue that is very much in the purview of the Pacific Island Forum, and we hope to be bringing um, some um, uh, work uh, to Pacific Island Forum uh, at, the, at its next meeting uh, in Samoa. It is a very complex issue uh, and one which I know, um, I know that the Commonwealth has taken an interest in this, particularly because what is happening in the Pacific is also an issue that is uh, pertinent to other parts of the world. Mm. So therefore it is an issue that uh, Australia and um, the Commonwealth, and I know that I've spoken to Patricia Scotland directly uh, about this issue, complex issue, but one that, uh, that um, um, has implications uh, under UNCLOS and implications across um, a broader spectrum as well. Uh, anything to add to that, or I'll go out to the audience no, for some more questions. That. It's exactly the same issue that Prime Minister Tuvalu raised with uh, the Secretary General during their last meeting in Napier. Mm, that's an issue. Great. Uh, why don't we go back out to the audience for another round of questions uh, before we wrap up? Uh, so this uh, gentleman uh, behind here, oh, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. Please go ahead. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, Ken Caldwell from Water Aid International. Uh, can I, in passing, thank you, the, the Senator for her personal commitment to water and sanitation issues, particularly for women, which has been much appreciated in the international uh, environment. Uh, but I want to come back to this theme about the Australian aid budgets uh, because I'm, I feel like we, we need to pursue that a bit further. Uh, the OECD figures you referred to in your remarks uh, talked about a further 15% cut in the Australian aid budget in 2017. And uh, I don't want to give the, the Senator a hard time on this because I know she's a passionate advocate of the, of the aid budget, but I'm interested in the politics of this in Australia. Uh, what needs to change politically in Australia for it to become an attractive prospect for Australian political leaders from across the spectrum to make the case for reversing the recent cuts in the aid budgets? And how can we help that to happen? Um, look, can I just, um, can I just say, uh, um, I understand that um, uh, there was a reference um, uh, in relation, two, two issues. I think that was a reference in relation to multilateral uh, spending. Uh, my understanding um, is that some countries did increase uh, their spending according to the um, Development Assistance Committee um, framework and definition, um, particularly in relation to in-country refugee costs. Um, the ODA spend of about 11 countries uh, increased due to in-donor refugee costs being counted as part of that. Australia does not count uh, and does not report um, in-donor refugee spending uh, in Australia. Uh, can I just say uh, on the, um, uh, we provided uh, our increase in aid uh, last year, it was increased to $3.9 billion, which was an increase of 2.2% on the previous year. Uh, next year and the year after, it will, our ODA spend will go up to $4 billion. Um, there are two points that I think are really important. Um, Recent uh, or surveys that have been conducted uh, in Australia uh, have indicated that um, about 80% of the Australian public uh, believe that we should not be spending more on aid or that the spend is uh, about right. Uh, however, when you do uh, speak to the development sector, they do believe that uh, you know it's the complete opposite. Uh, and they believe that there should be more spend uh, on ODA. So one of the important things is that you do have to take uh, your public with you in relation to ODA spend. And one of the things um, that I have found since becoming a minister is that I have sought to focus um, the debate, not necessarily on what we're doing, but more importantly, why we are doing it and what is the direct benefit to Australia. So Australia's... Um, ODA spend is, uh, um, as I said, uh, this year $3.9 billion. Of that, 90% of that has been spent in the Indo-Pacific area and a third of that uh, in the Pacific directly. Why? Because the stability, security and prosperity of our region 
um, is second only to the defence of Australia. Our defence white paper makes it very clear that um, of those parameters. So for, for me, uh, my primary objective is to um, say to the Australian uh, public, this is why it is important that we do spend uh, on overseas development. Um, ODA is not charity, it is assisting our neighbours to develop uh, and that's the point because we want to see our neighbours develop because we want them to then graduate because today's development assistance recipient is tomorrow's trading partner. So that's why for me, uh, my personal goal has really been to push um, this perception of ODA and how important uh, it is because of the direct benefits to Australia. Let me give you one very good example. Uh, at the last federal election, we indicated that we would have a regional health security. Why do we uh, a regional health security initiative? Uh, and that's a spend of about $300 million. Why? We have 10 million movements out of Australia every year. About half of those movements are to our region. So Australians who go off overseas to have a wonderful holiday in our region do not expect to pick up malaria or Zika or something like that. So therefore, for Australia uh, to assist in terms of the eradication of malaria or the eradication of Zika or tuberculosis, which is endemic, particularly in the western region of uh, Papua New Guinea, that's why we are spending money on health in assisting our neighbours to um, build their health systems so that they can then make the necessary investments in these health areas. Now, why are we doing that? <coughs> We're doing that because we want to build the health systems of our neighbours, but we are also doing that because that is a direct health benefit um, to the Australian public. So we don't want people to go overseas um, in our region and uh, go on a great cruise off somewhere and then come back with malaria or Zika or chukungunya or something like that. So anyway, we have lots of things that we're doing. Don't get me started on yeah. mosquitoes and what we're doing with mosquitoes uh, in Australia, but we are doing really good things uh, on this front. And, um, and, uh, and, and we're, we're piloting at the moment. Um, actually, I, I will raise this on, on the mosquito front. Uh, we're uh, we've got this pilot uh, going at the moment. What we've done is um, uh, with the mosquitoes that carry dengue and Zika and chikungunya, uh, they um, are a particular type of mosquito and if they are uh, infected with a particular um, bacteria uh, that, uh, and then they go out and breed with other mosquitoes in the wild, that means that um, um, it leads to the eradication of dengue, Zika and these other things. And so at the moment we're trialling them in urban areas because they're the sort of the mosquitoes that, uh, that uh, uh, carry dengue. And so by focusing on some urban areas, uh, including one in, uh, in Suva in, in Fiji, hopefully we will lead to the eradication uh, of dengue in these parts. Now that's a program, that's just one little program on a health front, but that's the sort of thing that will not just benefit our region, but quite frankly will help places in Australia that might have dengue as well. So, so it really comes back to that benefit. And, and, uh, and that's really where my focus has been. That's great. Hopefully you'll bring that passion to the public <laughs> and change some minds. I'm going to go to the last two questions here. The, uh, this young woman up front and the gentleman who's already holding the microphone. And then I'm afraid we're out of time. Thank you very much both for your comments. It's been wonderful as well to hear about the good work that both Australia and the Commonwealth are doing on climate change in the Pacific. I'd just like to ask a question related to the Commonwealth and climate change, where we've got a situation where one Commonwealth country, India, um, and uh, investors there are proposing to build a large coal mine in northern Australia. This coal mine would be one of the largest um, open-cut coal mines in the world, um, and it's been estimated that its annual emissions would be greater than those of the entire Pacific community combined. Um, so um, I would just be interested to know, given that both governments and civil society groups 
um, in the Pacific have raised concerns about this coal mines to the Australian government. Um, what the response would be, I guess, in the space of dialogue for issues like this within the Commonwealth, and also what um, the Minister's response would be to communities and governments who are raising concerns about the emissions that would be produced by this coal mine. And sorry, my name is Edward Boydell. I'm an independent consultant. Thank you. And up front for the final question. Thank you. My name's Latika Burke. I'm from the Sydney Morning Herald newspaper. Um, Minister, it's been wonderful to hear your obsession with mosquitoes, <laughs> and you? Uh, sadly, my question is not for you, it's for Albert. You said before that you're watching China's increasing spend on development loans and aids, uh, aid in, in the region uh, with interest. Are you watching that with concern or just amusement? Uh, so, so because we're coming to the end, I'll let our answer that and then go back to you for any final reflections. I will also say that I spent a year in Townsville yes. uh, as an exchange student, often feeling as though I had been put on earth to feed mosquitoes, so I'm glad you're doing <laughs> something, something about the problem. Um, just on, on the uh, coal mine, oh, I'm not aware of it, but if, it is, if it's an issue within the leaders, um, pretty sure it will be raised, but uh, apologies, I'm not aware of that issue as of yet. On the comment in terms of China, I mean, this is a issue that is pan-Commonwealth, not just in the Pacific, uh, and uh, we hear a lot of uh, uh, different, different opinions uh, from governments, of course, you know, this is their only uh, in terms of uh, resort to build infrastructure projects. Uh, I take the, the point uh, that it's made by the minister here, which is a very valid point. In terms of the Commonwealth's engagement, it's really just working with governments in terms of their capacity. We don't take a view on which uh, partner that the national government goes with, but we do try and support them through capacity building programs and uh, other activities that will support their development objectives. But in the whole politics of it, we kind of stay away from it. That's a matter for the national government to deal with. And final thoughts. Yes, um, just, just to your point, uh, Australia does um, take a, a, a neutral approach to uh, technology, and this has certainly been a debate. But can I tell you, Australia made commitments uh, as part of the Paris Agreement, and uh, uh, Australia is on track um, to meet its uh, emission uh, targets, and those targets of uh, 26 to 28 uh, per cent um, uh, reduction. and. As I've indicated, we are on track um, to meet our commitments under the Paris Agreement. And any final thoughts? Um, well, first of all, can I just thank you um, for this opportunity? I think um, I think it's been a, a very, very valuable um, uh, opportunity. As I said, look, um, Australia um, is very much um, committed um, to the Commonwealth. Um, we are very committed to growing partnerships. I think one of the important things as we uh, move um, forward, uh, particularly in relation to <coughs> development assistance, partnerships are really important. And so therefore, um, um, increasingly, um, no one country will be able to meet um, the challenges, particularly that our small island developing states and particularly the Pacific face. So therefore, um, it's important that we do have uh, multiple players uh, in this space. Uh, but it's also uh, a space where um, um, I think that partnerships increasingly, and that's partnerships between governments, partnerships with civil society, partnerships with the private sector. I mean, we haven't really touched on that, but one of the things that um, Australia has really very much focused is how can we get more private sector involvement in the development space? And so there's a whole range of discussions in relation um, to that that also have to be had. But um, in the end, um, our objective with assistance is basically to deliver uh, a better and fairer world. And certainly from Australia's perspective, uh, we have chosen to target our assistance uh, in our region, in our neighbourhood. Uh, we are the largest house uh, in the street in our neck of the woods. And so uh, we take our responsibilities very, very seriously uh, to ensure a stable, prosperous and, um, and secure neighbourhood. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I am left with questions. The audience is left with questions. We have some online. And that, to me, is always a good sign 
that we have had a really interesting, productive, and engaging conversation. Uh, so please join me in uh, thanking uh, Albert and the Senator so much for being here today, being generous with their time, uh, and taking some interesting and tough questions. Thank you.